Greetings! I'm going to show you how to use Jupyter and our Blockly extension for Jupyter. How you would start Jupyter depends on how you've installed it. If you installed it to your own computer, you would typically open up a terminal like this and type something like Jupyter Lab and wait for it to start. So you can see here it is starting in my default browser that is Firefox. However, uh, what I'm going to show you today is using Jupyter Hub. Um, everything I will show you in Jupyter Hub though works in Jupyter if you've installed it on your local machine. So let's uh, I'll close it down there. So let's look at Jupyter Hub. So a Jupyter Hub is a website that provides Jupyter for you. Uh, here's one that I've set up for myself. And in this case, it is auto logging me in with my Google account. Typically, when you access Jupyter, you'll see a launcher. A launcher is just a way of uh, creating file templates. So if I wanted to create a Jupyter notebook, I would click on one of these two options for uh, notebooks. I could also create a console or I could create other types of files like a terminal, text file, markdown file. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to start with uh, XPython. XPython or Zeus Python works best with our Blockly extension. So I clicked on that and it immediately opened up a Jupyter Notebook. You can tell that it's using Zeus Python uh, because it is listed here. That is uh, what is called the kernel, and I will explain that in a moment. But the key thing to understand about Jupyter and Jupyter Notebooks is this thing right here. This is called a cell. You'll notice that the cell is currently active or selected because it has a blue outline and a blue bar next to it. I can run this cell by pressing this play button. And when I run the cell, it creates another cell below it. You can see now that cell has a blue outline and a blue bar next to it. And the previous one is grayed out. If I click in the previous cell, it is now active. So one cell, another cell. These cells are both code cells. That means that we can put programs in them and run those programs. You can tell that this is a code cell two ways. One is, is that uh, as it is highlighted, this drop down here says code. And you also know that it is a code cell because there is this little box next to it. What does that box do? That box will tell you the order that your cell has been run in, which will make sense here in a moment. So let's say that I have a variable x and I want to assign to it the number three. I run that cell. You can see now that the cell has been run with something in it. It now has a one in it. The next cell, I can just say x and run that. And you can see two things happened here. I ran the cell, I got a two. And I also got something below it, um, which is the output of a three. If I come back up here and I click on this cell with X in it, you can see that it is selected. It has the blue box and the blue bar, but you can also see that the cell or the, the region, I should say below it is also selected. This is called an output. And if a cell produces an output, the two are kind of linked together. You have the cell and you have its corresponding output. You can see here they both have the number two. The second two is in a kind of orange color. Um, you can see that the output has no selected region around it like this does. It doesn't have the blue box, but it does have the blue bar. So this is a key concept with Jupyter Notebooks. You have a cell and then you have a cell output if it exists. Jupyter will always try to produce an output 
with whatever the last line of the cell is. So if I come up here and I say uh, XX and I run this, it will still give me three because the last thing in the cell was just this X, right? So you it did not produce three, three, which you might have otherwise expected. Now notice when I ran this again, this now says three. It doesn't say two, right? It advanced by one, it now says three. I can come back up here to my first cell and run it again, and it now says four. So another key concept here, you can run these cells in any order you like. Um, it can get confusing, so it's usually a good idea to just run them uh, from the top to the bottom. Um, but you can run them in any order if you want to. Now, why is this confusing? Well, I can come up here and I can say x equals 2 now. And notice this still says 3. And it says 3 because we have not rerun this cell, right? We would have to run this cell again in order to update it. And the numbering here gives you a sense of what is and is not up to date. So since this is 5 now, this first cell is 5, we can guess or expect that the cell below it is no longer current because it has a lower number than five. That's a trick, something to remember, um, kind of keep you from getting confused. So let's look at the other primary type of cell here, which is a markdown cell. You can see here I have an option for markdown. Now you'll notice a couple of things happened when I selected markdown from this dropdown the number disappeared here. I can still select the cell, it's still in a blue box, but now it doesn't have a, a number spot. And that's because this is no longer code. So I can type anything here. Um, hello, welcome to, oops, Jupiter. And I can hit play. And what you see here is just text, like you would see in any web page, um, very similar to an output cell, but with no number next to it. Now, this may seem silly, um, but it is part of the power of Jupyter. What you can do with Jupyter in uh, plain English is create uh, programs that people can, or create documents that people can read like a report but run like a program. So anything that I can do in a, a document and in Word, I can do with uh, Markdown. So let's say that I want to have a title, uh, my first notebook. And notice that it is now large and in a kind of title style. And we did that with this hash mark. So there's lots of different things that you can do. Uh, maybe I should say introduction. There's lots of different things you can do with formatting uh, in Markdown. And to do them, you need to know some of these very simple formatting tricks. So I just made notebook bold. You can do all kinds of lists, element one, element two, element three. You can hyperlink things. Let's go to Google. Oops. I guess it's HTTPS these days. And now that's a hyperlink. And if I click on it, it will open up Google. And there's many, many things you can do here. Let's, I'll show you one more, but also um, reference a standard uh, markdown guide. So here's an image. I can drag and drop this image. So I just grabbed the file over here from a folder and dropped it over here. And now when I run this, I now have an image that I got off the internet uh, because I work at the University of Memphis.
Um, but you can also copy and paste from your uh, uh, file buffer from your clipboard um, any any kind of image here as well. Lots of things that you can do. Um, Markdown cheat sheets exist. You can see here. I like to look look for them. Um, and so anything you see in one of these cheat sheets, for the most part, will work in Jupyter. So lots of things you can do. Very, it's very rich. You can do tables. You can do all kinds of things. Okay. So this is interesting, um, and it's very programmer oriented. What I've shown you so far. Uh, used by programmers, used by computer scientists, used uh, by data scientists, but it requires that you know how to program. Um, so, you know, what if you don't know how to program? Well, if you don't know how to program, uh, we have integrated something called Blockly into Jupyter, and that is what I'm going to uh, show you next. And along the way, maybe a few more tricks for just using Jupyter in general. So to use this Blockly extension, um, you have to install it. And an extension is just a companion program that goes along with Jupyter that is embedded in Jupyter. If you've ever heard of a plugin, um, any, you know, they're often used in browsers, a plugin or an extension. It's the same kind of concept. So I just clicked on it over here. It opened up. And now I have this uh, Blockly palette. Now the interplay between Jupyter and the Blockly palette may be a little bit confusing at first. The key idea is that you can create arrangements of blocks, hit this blocks to code button, and then those blocks will be converted into code that goes into the active cell. Um, because it's code, you want that active cell to be a code cell, or it will give you some kind of error. So to uh, do what we did before, we can create a variable uh, called x. And when we do that, it gives us many different options uh, for blocks that use x. Let's start off with this set x to block. And we can get another block to set the value of x. Um, the Blockly uh, palette over here is organized into categories for different kinds of functions. So everything to do with variables, for the most part, is in this variables category. To get a number, you would go to math uh, to get a number or operate on a number. So here you can see we have it 1, 2, 3. Uh, hopefully you heard those blocks click together and you could see that they're they're kind of magnetic they want to click together in certain ways and this lets you create programs that are syntactically correct without worrying about things like white space so in general the blocks are designed to prevent you from making errors and that's one of the things that makes it easier to program with them than with a normal programming language um, something else to note here is that this block came with one, two, three in it, a default value. Many of the blocks have default values, but you can change them to whatever you want. So I just changed it to three by clicking on the block and typing with my keyboard. Something else uh, to note about these blocks is that you can um, right click on them. You can duplicate, add a comment, disable. There's all kinds of things that you can do. Um, keyboard shortcuts work, so I'm going to hit Control C and then Control V, and you'll notice that I created a copy not only of the selected block, which was set X2 and has a yellow uh, outline around it, but also all of the blocks that it is connected to, um, kind of its child blocks, uh, if you would. I can also delete this block by putting it into the trash can. I can click on the trash can and I can see that that block is inside it. So those are just some, some basic things about using Blockly. Let's show the more interesting part, which is the Jupyter integration. So I can now hit blocks to code. You can see all the time that I was over here clicking these together, it didn't produce code over here. 
Um, we didn't want it to do that until I was ready, right? So now I'm going to hit blocks to code. And you can see in this code cell a few things appeared. One is, is x equals 3, which we expected. And then there's also this uh, kind of uh, gobbledygook at the bottom. That gobbledygook at the bottom allows Jupiter to reconstruct the blocks over here uh, later on, which is something we might want to do. So before we go any further, let's run this cell. And you can see we got a number next to it. Everything looks great. We can also tell it to uh, output x in this if we want it to, just by grabbing an x block by itself. And we have x equals 3, and we, we ask for x. We run that, and we get 3. <clears throat> now, notice uh, something else here. When we ran this code cell and uh, got off it, you know, advanced to the next cell, all our blocks disappeared. And when we click on the cell again, they come back. And that's what this gobbledygook at the bottom does in this, this comment. It tells Blockly how to reconstruct the blocks and put them back over here. So the coordination between Jupiter and Blockly is uh, pretty loose. Um, you can use Jupiter entirely without Blockly. And when you use Blockly, you're only using it to create code that you then run in Jupiter. So when you get to a point where you no longer need Blockly, you can just turn it off. You can also uh, just write code over here if you want to. I can say x equals 2 and x and run that and get 2, right? So you can use both if you want to. And that's another um, advantage to this. If you feel like you need help doing something more complicated, you can go to Blockly and do that. Like if I need to, you know, make uh, a loop, right? Or actually, let's not do that. Let's do, you know, repeat 10 times. And let's say I want to print, let's say I want to print hello. Aha. Let's say I want to print hello 10 times and I don't know how to write a Python program to do that. I can do it in Blockly. I can get some code over here. And if I want to, I can even edit this, this code, right? Because it's just, once it's over here, it's just code. Now, the thing to remember is, is if you do come over here and you edit it, and then you come back to Blockly and you hit blocks to code, it will erase whatever changes you made over here. Um, and that's just kind of the nature, nature of the beast right now. Um, let me get into some of these other features along the bottom. So one is uh, Notebook Sync. And Notebook Sync is what causes this behavior. So every time I click on a cell, it will reconstruct the blocks over here. If I turn that off, the blocks will freeze. And it will not do that. Now that can be useful in some situations. Uh, oftentimes, you can work uh, and just keep Notebook Sync on. Um, if you get to a point where you want to turn it off, turn it off. It's a personal preference. Now, what, what does Notebook Sync do? Notebook Sync um, implicitly calls code to blocks. So I'm going to call code to blocks now. You can see I've got this cell selected. And when I hit code to blocks, it mapped it over uh, to the left, to Blockly. Now, just to make this absolutely crystal clear, I'm now on a Jupyter code cell that was not produced by Blockly. Um, it doesn't have the gobbledygook at the bottom. And I hit code to blocks, and nothing happens. In fact, the blocks I had were just erased. So this is an important distinction. Code to blocks does not change arbitrary code to blocks. Code to blocks just takes this gobbledygook that was created by um, Blockly originally and creates blocks from that. So that's what code to blocks really means. Perhaps it's a bad name, I don't know. Um, just turn Notebook Sync back on. And then the last thing here is report bug. If you click on that, it will take you to my GitHub repo and you can, um, you can make a new issue. Um, you can see I've got some things here to work on. 
All right, so let's let's talk about things that are perhaps a little bit more advanced for a moment. So in any kind of programming, it's not uncommon to need to do uh, some level of copying. There are different ways that you can copy. I've already shown you one. You can click on one of these blocks and you can hit Control C, Control V, and you can copy it right there on the workspace. But what if you wanted this uh, in a different code cell? So I'm gonna select set X to three. I'm gonna hit Control C. I'm gonna come down here. I've got this new new blank cell. I can come back to the workspace and I can hit Control V and there's my block. Now, if I want to uh, keep it, I better hit blocks to code and make it appear over here. Otherwise, if I click on another cell in the meantime, it'll disappear and never come back. So that's one way you can copy a block between cells. There's another way you can copy a block between cells. So I'm gonna come up here to my fancy loop. I'm gonna hit Control A to copy everything that's in this, this cell. Control C, come back down here, Control A. I'm just gonna hit Delete so it's crystal clear. And then hit Control V. And all I've done here is I've copied the text contents of the cell down here. So what's going to happen? Um, what's going to happen is, is as soon as I uh, click on the cell, it will reconstruct the blocks over here. So there's two different ways of copying blocks between cells. You can actually copy the block block, the graphical block, um, click on a cell and then paste the block over in Blockly. Or you can just take code from one cell and copy it to another. Um, easy peasy. Now there are a lot of things with Jupyter that are, uh, make it even easier to use. You've, you've already seen me do some things with keyboard shortcuts. There's just a handful of keyboard shortcuts that I use all the time that I think are really important. Um, one is, is that it's, it's kind of annoying to me personally to keep hitting this play button over and over again. So there's a keyboard shortcut for that. So I have this cell uh, selected and I'm just gonna hold down the shift key and then press enter. And it ran the cell for me. I didn't have to hit the play button. Very, very useful. Um, I can also create a cell above this or a cell below. I hit escape first and I just hit escape and let go. I'm not holding it down. And then I hit the letter A and it created a cell above. So A for above. Click the cell again, hit escape. You'll notice some of the highlighting went away and hit B. And now I got a cell below. Notice the cell below appeared after the output. So very useful. I can also delete cells, hit escape, hit the letter D and then hit the letter D again, just so it knows you're serious. So sorry, I hit, it was too slow, so I hit it twice close together. Escape, D, D. Went away, D, D. Went away. Something else that you can do is uh, right click in the margin over here in Jupyter and get a nice pop-up. And this will let you do things like uh, copy cells. So I can copy the cell and its output and I can go say right up here to the very top and then paste cells below and I can paste these cells below. So lots of ways to copy and paste things. I can also uh, come out here in the margin and notice my um, mouse pointer has changed to the kind of classic move grab and move icon with four arrows. If I left click and hold down and then drag, I can actually drag this to different locations in the notebook. So there are lots of different options for uh, changing things. Let me do that again and make a real change so you can see it. There are lots of different options for moving things around, for copying things. It's very powerful. Best thing to do is to try right-clicking and see what options you have. You can also find all of these things up in the menu in familiar places. 
So under File, we have various save options. Um, also, interestingly, you can export your notebook to things like HTML or PDF to make a report. In the Edit menu, you can find the copying and pasting of cells functions that I just mentioned. Um, lots of options for viewing things, for running things. I just showed you how to run one cell at a time. You can run multiple cells at a time. You can um, run all cells, um, all sorts of things you can do. All right, let's talk about uh, the kernel next. So how is it doing what it's doing? This is a little bit deeper, but it's very useful to know if you run into any problems. So what we wrote here is some Python code that takes the value 2 and stores it in the variable x. This uh, interface that you see, this notebook, isn't what's actually running that code. What's running that code is something called a kernel, which we've briefly mentioned before. In this case, it is the Zeus Python or XPython kernel. So what's happening here is this notebook is sending a, a request or a message to that kernel. That kernel is executing the code, and then it's sending some sort of result back. What this means is that this kernel has a memory for each one of the commands you've previously run. And that's why these numbers are important. Because if I take x and I set it to 2 here, I'm basically, whatever was an x before, I just wiped it out, right? So here you can see before x was 3, right? Um, but now I've set x to 2, and x no longer has 3 in it because it has 2 in it. So the kernel that's sitting over here has this memory. It remembers what x is supposed to be. It remembers your program. It remembers whatever kinds of libraries you load to do things. Um, the reason that this is important is because A, it can help you understand the behavior when you execute these cells in kind of funny orders. Like here I went 5, then 3, then 10. Of course, this was copied from below. Um, the, the kernel will keep it all straight for you. But something to watch out for is that sometimes the kernel dies and uh, if you blow something up. And when it dies, it will say here, no kernel. So when things go wrong, you should, you should look for, uh, that's one of the things you should look for is if your kernel is dead. All right, let's clear some of this stuff out. Um, so I'm gonna show you another trick. I'm gonna hit the shift key and hit the down arrow. And I just selected everything and I'll just say delete cells with a right click. So let's, let's back up for a second here and look at some um, of the more interesting behavior of our, our Blockly extension. So let's import a library and let's do a data science library called pandas. So you have to know the name of the library. It's just a standard Python library and when we uh, import it, we have the option of giving it a proper name. To do that, we use this rename variable option. So very commonly in programming, Python programming, people will uh, give pandas the alias of PD. It's just a convention. You could call it anything you wanted to. So now I'm going to hit blocks to code. We have this code cell here. So this code cell is going to ask Jupyter to import this library, which means that we can, we can use the library. We can call functions in it and do things with it. So first we need to run the cell, which I will do with shift enter. And if you were paying attention, you might've seen that there was a little star here uh, and then it changed to 11. That star was an indicator that the kernel was working and it was going to get us a result as soon as it could. Another thing that you might have noticed if you were looking quickly enough was that this circle over here, which is currently hollow, went to being filled. So right now I'm moused over it and it says kernel idle, but if it had been filled or blinking, it would have said something like kernel active or kernel running. So we now have imported pandas as PD. I'm going to show you um, some of the interesting things that we can do with it. So these purple blocks here, or indigo blocks, 
are uh, what I call IntelliBlocks. And these are blocks that are driven with something called IntelliSense. IntelliSense is a Microsoft term. Notice this is blinking, by the way. So, uh, and it said not to find until you run code. And then it went and got uh, this list of options here. So IntelliSense, I believe, is a Microsoft term developed by Microsoft. But what it is, is a way of the kernel telling you what options you have for a particular uh, variable or piece of code. So you can see here, PD says signature pandas, um, says it's a module. And this can be hard to understand. This is basically do uh, programmer documentation, but it's there and I can mouse over array and it says some things about array. In fact, it's saying so much about array, it looks like it's going off screen. <laughs> Even still, it's going off screen. But uh, that information is, is in there somewhere. And these are all the things that we can do with pandas. So one thing that we can do that's kind of useful is we can read CSV. So that means read a CSV file and it will give us back a data frame. But we have to tell it what CSV file to read. So I am going to tell it. Uh, and hopefully I remember the path here correctly. So data wise content notebooks, data sets, baseball, CSV. Now, how did I know uh, what to call it? Up here on the left, there are various uh, kind of special menus. We've already seen this one, which is how we loaded the extension. This one right here is our file browser. And it will show us uh, our current file, which you can see here is untitled and it's got a little green mark next to it, which means it has a running kernel. And you can see untitled over here is the name of our, our open notebook. And we also have folders over here that we can double click and look inside. And this was DataWise Content Notebooks. And this is data sets. And look, there's baseball. So that is how I got this right here. This is called a path. And depending on your operating system, this uh, divider between folders may look different. Um, but in Unix, Linux, and Mac OS, it is a I believe that's a forward slash and or maybe it's a backslash always getting confused but in uh, windows it goes the other way so anyway this is how we read a csv so i can hit blocks to code and it generated this code for us over here which i will then execute with shift enter and this is a nice feature so again um, jupiter has displayed the last thing in the cell so in this case, the last thing in the cell was a data frame. This is basically a, like a spreadsheet um, with column headers. So you can see these are the names of the variables and this baseball data set, like hits, home runs, runs, RBI, walks, et cetera, et cetera. And it also gives us rows. Now notice here, it's got a dot, dot, dot. So it doesn't show all the rows because that would take up too much space. So it's smart enough not to blow up our, our, our notebook with a bunch of stuff we may not want to see, but it shows us the first five and the last five, and it tells us how many things there were. So, you know, very nice option. Um, and also uh, it does this with plots as well. So let's do a few more things with these IntelliBlocks. So as I just said, uh, when you have the last line be a data frame, it will display the data frame but what if we capture that data frame in a variable so we can do something with it? So let's create a variable. Click on this button, create variable. I'm going to name it data frame and then get a set block. So let me show you um, some of the gotchas here with the blocks. So you'll notice that with the IntelliBlock, there's a little glitch here. When I move it, things get offset and that also has a tendency to happen when you connect it to another non IntelliBlock. So you can see that these blocks are now connected to each other but they're not uh, appropriately fit together. 
One way to uh, uh, work around that until we get that, that bug fixed is to click other blocks into IntelliBlocks. And you'll see that that worked perfectly fine. So if you let uh, the IntelliBlock stay where it is and bring another block to it, you'll have no problem is the, the basic point there. So I'm going to uh, set data frame to that IntelliBlock, hit blocks to code, and you can see that now we have data frame equals here. If I run this cell with shift enter, you can see there's now no longer any output. If I wanted output here, oops, on the wrong cell. If I wanted output here uh, and I wanted to save the data frame, I would just drag a data frame block uh, by itself, bear there, and run that. And then I get both, which is useful. So there are various kinds of things that you can do with this data frame variable. And again, this shows the kinds of things that you can do with IntelliBlocks. So you'll see here, we've got these blocks that we can do things with, with data frame. And just to make it clear, now we have data frame and PD. So we can still do things with, with PD. We just need to change this dropdown to match the variable that we want to do things with. So with data frame, let's do uh, describe. Now, this is a great example here. Notice how many things are in here. I think it's over 100. Uh, I'd have to, to count it, which obviously I don't want to do. But some of these uh, Python libraries <laughs> give you a lot of options. So it can be challenging to search through them, and um, that's that's part of the things that you need to learn. Um, once you select one, you can hover over it and get some documentation about it. Um, and of course, you can always go to the web to get more information about it as well. So I'm gonna hit blocks to code and run the cell. And now we see a tabular output, it's not a data frame per se, um, although it might actually be, in, uh, if we saved it, we might get something like that. But you can see here descriptive statistics. Um, so we can see you know, how many uh, uh, items we have, how many observations of the at bat variable we have, the mean of those observations, standard deviation, minimum, various percentiles, maximum. And we get that for all variables. So just an example of, of one of the things that you can do with the IntelliBlox. Let's look at a, a plot quickly. So to do a plot, um, we would import again. So the, the best library that we found that works with these IntelliBlox and with uh, JupyterHub is uh, Plotly. Um, there are other libraries that you will often see like matplotlib the problem with those in a JupyterHub instance is that they're not really web technologies. So they would work fine with this if you had it installed on your local computer, but not with a JupyterHub uh, because they're not web technologies. So we just imported this block. Let's uh, run it. So we just imported Plotly. And now we can do things with Plotly. So uh, with Plotly Express, let's do a histogram. And now we have to tell it uh, what, what to use here. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of a key idea in programming. Um, sometimes you can tell uh, Python or the kernel to do something, and you don't have to give it anything. To, to do that thing with. So when I told it data frame describe, it was basically like, well, yeah, I describe myself. Like I'm the data frame, so I'm gonna describe myself. But in this case, we're asking Plotly to plot, and we need to tell it what we want it to plot. So specifically, we want it to plot something in the data frame. Now there are a couple of different ways of, of doing this. Um, let me show you one way, uh, and that is to use lists. And this also gives me an opportunity to show you uh, another Blockly feature, which is this, this little green, sorry, blue uh, icon here. So before I show you that blue icon, let me just give you the basic idea. 
So the, the semantics here of what we're trying to do is we want to plot something in the data frame. So first we're just going to tell it, hey, we want to plot something in the data frame, right? And then the second thing we're going to ask it or tell it to do is the specific variable that we want it to plot. Now again, knowing what goes in a list like this goes back to basically how the library was constructed. So you would find this in documentation. Um, if we mouse over histogram, it'll give you some options here that can be pretty difficult for a non-programmer to read and understand. Actually, even if you're a programmer, they're hard to read and understand. So it's the kind of thing that you would either get um, from a, one of our instructional notebooks showing you specifically how to do this, or you could get it off the internet by looking at examples. So, and this actually gives me a great option to show you something else, which is a freestyle block. So freestyle blocks are basically blockly blocks that you can type arbitrary Python code into. And they're particularly useful for stuff like this. So in this case, we need to tell it that we want the y axis, sorry, the x axis to be, let's just say hits. And this is just a Python convention you would say x equals hits here. It's a, what's called a named parameter. So let's go ahead and do blocks to code. And this gives me an opportunity to show you something that's not great. Notice this none here at the end. That none lines up with this empty slot in the list. So empty slots and lists are bad because the way that Blockly handles those is instead of saying, oh, uh, it's empty, so I actually only want a list with two things in it, Blockly says, oh, it's empty, you must want a list that has three things, but the last thing here is what, what Python calls none, which stands for basically no value. And that's not what we want. If we ran this cell, it will throw an error. So this is what an error looks like. It's pink. You can see here that it says uh, it's a syntax error. And you know here it gives you a somewhat cryptic positional argument follows keyword argument. Um, you know, who, who knows what that means here? <laughs> um, some of these are more useful than others. But anyway, that's what an error looks like. So uh, it is possible to still get errors with Blockly. Most of the time, the errors you get will be because you did something that semantically didn't make sense, um, which you may not know early on. So how do we fix this? So uh, I mentioned this blue gear icon before. So if you click on that, it opens this special little window, uh, this kind of call out or pop out. And you see a um, miniature palette and workspace. So just like this big palette where you've got this gray bar here and you've got this big white workspace area, you've got a little gray bar which is your palette, which only has one kind of thing on it, and a workspace, which is this white area. And you can add list items by dragging an item block over like that. So now we have four items in this little pop-up, and we have four items in our list. Similarly, you can remove slots by dragging blocks over. Now notice that I dragged, I, I clicked on the third block, I'm holding my left mouse button down, and I'm actually carrying two with it. And that's just the way that Blockly works. You have kind of a parent or head block and everything that's attached to the bottom will follow it, right? And you can see as soon as I grab these, it, it popped out the two that were there, um, which is not what we wanted. Now, just for, for giggles here, here's a cool trick. If you ever, for some reason, want to move things um, around a little bit, you can. So I can actually grab this middle one and move it to the top. So if for some reason I wanted to do that, I could. Um, so this may be kind of confusing, but it's just an example here of how you can shuffle things around. Now, just to kind of get us back on, on track, all I really wanted to do was remove this. Now I've got a list. It's got two slots. It's got something in each slot. I'm gonna hit blocks to code. And now you can see that none disappears and I'm gonna run it. Now you can see here, it's taking longer and uh, you saw that star there, maybe you saw this, this circle filled at the top. It takes longer to, to plot something. It's doing some serious work there. 
So here you can see a histogram of uh, hits and it's approximately a uh, normal distribution. You can see that for some poor souls, uh, hits were, were zero. Um, for some top players, the hits were very large. And for most players, it was in between. Um, what you're already seeing here is that this is an interactive graph, Plotly. Um, so as I hover over different columns and, and some graphs, even different data points, it will actually uh, give me a little annotation that says what the value of that is. You can do things like zoom, you can take uh, screenshots or download as a, a ping. There's all sorts of fancy stuff you can do with Plotly. That's one of the things that makes it so cool. Um, and it's all web native, so it works great in Jupyter Hub. Now, just to kind of clarify something that I've said before, um, when you call PX histogram here, it creates a plot. And since this is the last cell, it displays the plot, right? Right below it and that the output component of the cell. So that's why it did it. If we wanted to save this histogram in a, in a figure, it would no longer do that. So we could come over here, let me click on this, and we could create a variable, and we could call it fig, um, and then we could set fig, and you'll see here I'm, I'm doing my little trick. Now here's another little gotcha. See this little red X over my hand? That tells me that I'm off screen, and uh, if I let go of this block, which I'll go ahead and do, it'll eat it, right? It just, it just trashed it, because I was too far off the screen. So that is one kind of interesting thing if you go off to the right. I'm not sure why Blockly does that, but it, it does it. So I'll click these together, blocks to code, run the cell, and now my figure is gone, right? Because I saved it in a variable. So when you save it in a variable, there's nothing to output. To, to output something, you need like a, either a command that by its very nature returns something, like a print command or a plot command or, or whatever, or you can have a bare, what I like to call a bare variable, a variable just sitting there that you haven't assigned to anything. Uh, and I already showed this before with the data frame, but you can see it again here with, with Plotly. Okay, so that's that's the basic idea. Let's let's look at a couple of other little gotchas here. So when your blocks, when you have a lot of blocks, um, they can get very big and sometimes be hidden. Um, it depends on how big your screen is. You can see here I'm in HD, so I've got a fair amount of space. But even still, uh, I wouldn't personally want much less space than that. If you're working on a screen with a smaller resolution, you'll find that your, your blocks will, will always be going off screen. And that's obviously difficult. It makes it more difficult. The best way to deal with that is to change the zoom resolution on your browser. So if I come over here and I go to zoom um, in Chrome, this is one way to do it. In other browsers, there, there are different methods. I can zoom out and see everything is getting smaller. So if your eyes are good and you know that works for you, then you can make quite a bit of space just by zooming. You know, obviously it'll make everything everything smaller. There are other interesting things that you can do as well um, with with tabs and to kind of manage your space. So if you know of an existing um, notebook that has some code in it that you want. And by the way, I'm just going to save here. Um, so, and let me kind of point out this, point this out to you. Um, see how this is untitled IPYNB and that this is an X, that means it's saved. If I hit Control S to save, you can see down here it says saving completed. Let me make a little change. So I'm going to delete this block. Hit blocks to code. And now you can see that it's a black circle <clears throat> up there because it hasn't saved it. If I hit Control S, that black circle went to an X. So it will periodically autosave in Jupyter Hub and, and also in Jupyter. But if you want to save something, you should hit Control S or come over here to File and you know hit Save Notebook over here. Um, all right, so let's show what happens with uh, opening another notebook. So I've got a ton of notebooks over here that are really 
you know, quite excellent. This is our first uh, version of content. And I know that in some of them, there are um, ways of doing plots. So let's say that I want to plot something and I don't remember how. Conveniently, here's one called plotting IPI and B. So I can double click that and it opens it. I'm going to go ahead and click on this file browser icon up here on the top left to close this pane, right? So I just close the pane, click it again, it opens, opens, close. Closing these side panes is a great way to recover some of your space. So here we have uh, a different notebook, the plotting notebook, and you can see that it's opened as a tab. So I now have three tabs on the right. I've got just a console tab, which we haven't talked about. Uh, but this is just a console you can run any kind of Linux command in, like show me what my files are. I've got the notebook that we've been working on up to this point, and then I've got a different one for plotting. I've still got the Blockly palette over here. So um, the Blockly palette will send uh, code through blocks of code to whatever notebook cell you have open over here. Haha. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about that error. It'll send it to whatever notebook cell you have over here. So if I create a new one and I, you know, have something like, you know, set fig to, let's just do something dumb here, set fig to, oops, to one, two, three, blocks to code. You can see it just plopped it into this notebook that I previously I hadn't been using at all. Okay, so um, Blockly doesn't really doesn't care, right? Its only purpose is to generate code that then Jupyter is, is using. Let's talk about this error that we just saw. I'm going to delete this, escape, DD, and you can see this, this error that it just popped up. So notice it says unable to perform code to blocks. XML is either invalid or renames existing variables. Specific error message is variable PX is already in use and its ID is a bunch of crazy digits, okay? So the reason it did that is because we've already created a PX variable uh, in our other notebook. And when uh, Blockly represents those, it gives them each a unique ID. And this can create problems when you're trying to copy things across notebooks, and there's not a really great way of dealing with it right now. Um, part of the reason it's done, I believe, is to give you the ability to rename variables. And one of the best ways to avoid it is to essentially never rename variables. Just, just don't do it. Only you, when you import something and you want to give it an alias, rename then. Otherwise, never rename a variable. It's just a bad idea. So um, let's, let's show you how to get out of that particular problem. There's different ways of dealing with it. But let's show you one way. So one way is to refresh your browser, and this will make Blockly forget about everything it's previously known about what variables are defined. So I'm just going to reload the page. Jupyter is smart enough to uh, open up my tabs again. The Blockly extension is currently not that smart, so I'm going to open it again. And now I have Blockly. And I can click on the same cell that gave me an error before, and I have no error. Uh, because Bl Blockly has no conflict because it forgot about the thing you previously told it about. So, you know, this gives me a way of, um, of easily copying and resolving this conflict. Now, um, there are different ways that you could try to copy from uh, this notebook to the other notebook. Let me switch back to the other notebook quickly. Um, I want to avoid a problem where I get that conflict again, so I'm just going to create some cells above with Control A. So uh, we can copy between notebooks. I can click on this block and hit Control C. I can come back to this other notebook, go to my workspace, select my workspace. So I just clicked in my workspace, Control V, and it just copied the block, and I can hit blocks to code. And that's how I just copied between these two workspaces, right? Interestingly, it even put it in the same position, which is kind of funny. I can also um, copy the code like I showed before. So here's the code. I hit Control A, Control C, and I came back over here, and you know I'll do it down here even. Uh, 
control V and you can see it's exactly the same and I can click on one and the other and it's reconstructing the blocks it's the same that's one way to copy you can also do uh, multiple cell copies so if I click here in the margin and you see the cell is selected with this blue bar I can hold down the shift key and down arrow and now I've selected multiple cells I can right click and copy cells come over to this notebook let's do it below this one right click in the margin paste cells below and now I have all those other cells that I just copied I'm gonna go ahead and delete these to make it less confusing here so let's go back so um, one other thing I think is useful to show here is that you can place these tabs. Uh, so right now it's just by default opened up three tabs here, but I can, sorry, I can left click on the tab and drag it and place it wherever I want. So you can see this blue outline is showing me a kind of preview of where it would go. So I can drop it over here um, to the left of Blockly. I find that personally very confusing. Uh, what I find much more confusing is to take it over here, sorry, much less confusing, is to take it over here. And now we have something I, I like to call three-pane view, where I can see, you know, the notebook that I'm trying to copy things into, it's in the middle, right? So I just, here's the cell I just copied into. And here's the notebook that I'm trying to copy from. And I can just, you know, do my same copying operations as before, but uh now i can see everything um, and i personally find that a little bit easier so just to kind of crystallize this a bit so here i clicked on import plotly express as px when i did that it put the blocks over here into blockly um, and then i can say you know copy them so Control c click on say this cell right and then Control v and then hit blocks to code and put it there so i personally find this a lot easier uh, to do but um, you know personal preferences whatever whatever works for you the major point here is just to know that you can position these things on uh, these tabs in a way that best matches your workflow um, let me see so i think we've covered basically everything at this point um, some of the things to watch out for. Um, let's let's refresh. Let's refresh this. So let's close this, and let's refresh this. Yeah, I don't care if things have been saved. So let's say that you have uh, previously uh, run a uh, or saved a notebook and you come back to mess with it later and you open up your Blockly extension and you know I click on this data frame uh, now in this case uh, it actually reloaded the IntelliSense here um, let me just do blocks to code let me run it see what it does all right in that case it worked <laughs> let me let me choose a more pathological example okay sorry I'm, I'm trying to break it and sometimes uh, sometimes you have to work for that and sometimes you don't all right let's let's really try to break it so I'm going to show you a different option that I haven't shown you before and that's this circle with a white square inside and this will show you all of your running kernels so interestingly here and maybe unexpectedly to you there's still a kernel running for the plotting notebook even though we closed it so we can go ahead and shut that down and we can also shut down the kernel for our Zeus Python over here. Watch what happens when we do that. So now over here it says no kernel. So let's uh, open up Blockly. So if I click on import Plotly Express as PX, sorry, I need to click on it twice, it will uh, bring it up. 
And it feels like things are working, like we just hit import platly express as px. But if we hit, uh, if we run the cell, so shift enter, nothing seems to, to go wrong, but also nothing seems to go right. So notice that no error was thrown, but also there's no number here uh, in the brackets. So it's acting as though it successfully ran that cell, even though nothing happened. So I'm going to hit shift enter, shift enter, shift enter, shift enter. So put us back on this. So import pandas as PD. It's still got the one that it had before. Now I'm going to hit shift enter and you'll see that that one went away. So it's let us move through the cell, but it hasn't run the cell. And this can create all sorts of strange confusing errors. So here you can see uh, with PD it says do not defined until you execute code. And the reason it's it's saying that is because the code has not been run. We have this import pandas as PD cell right above it, right? And we thought we ran that, but we have no kernel. So nothing actually happened here. Now um, this is a kind of error that you'll see or a kind of message that you'll sometimes see with the IntelliBlox. And it can be confusing and difficult to uh, work with. Sometimes there's a real failure, uh, like in this case, there's no kernel. So it's, I would say, not our, our fault uh, with the IntelliBlox. It's not the IntelliBlox fault. It really hasn't been defined. Um, sometimes the the problem is with the IntelliBlox and you can kind of you can try different strategies for fixing it um, so one strategy is just to click uh, PD again so I call this wiggling the block and sometimes when you do that it will refresh this of course you still have to have a kernel running for that to work um, another thing that you can sometimes do is rerun the cells above um, so run all of your cells until you get to the point where it says not defined. Sometimes that will make it work. And sometimes you just need to reload the page. So there's really a, a set of steps here uh, to follow when you get an error like this. So the first thing I would always recommend doing is seeing if you have a kernel. Um, now let me just kind of talk through what I just did. So I went over to where it said no kernel. I left clicked it. and Right now, we recommend you use Zeus Python. Um, it just has better IntelliSense than regular Python does. You, you'll have fewer problems. So I hit select. So now we have Zeus Python here. But if I if I run this, or if I you know mess with this in other ways that I just described, it won't actually work because we still haven't imported pandas as PD. So the next thing that you can try in a situation like this is to run that cell. You can see that this circle is filled. It's working very hard and it found read CSV. So, you know, not only did it uh, find all of our options here, but it even remembered which option we currently had selected. Um, so that's just an example of how to work through a problem when something with the software has gone wrong. Like I said, another option is to do what I call a wiggle. Um, so let me do a, a stronger wiggle so I can go to PX here. So PX, you can see, is also not defined, right? And that's because we haven't gone back and rerun this first cell up here where we defined PX. But we can go back to PD. This is what I call a wiggle. And you can see that, yes, here's read CSV. Um, so again, sometimes just, just clicking on this option again can cause it to go look. And in fact, that's great. You can see it right there. So when I click on uh, PD, if the screen capture is working well and you can see this even though it's happening very quickly, it will briefly say waiting for kernel right here and then it'll come back with read CSV. So I'll do it one more time just in case you couldn't see it before. It's really just a fraction of a second. Um, so again, that's one way. And then really the, the, the final uh, way, uh, maybe I shouldn't say not the final, the, the almost final way is just to reload the page. That's when uh, Blockly goes berserk and you just need to reset it. And then the, the ultimate, ultimate way to, uh, you know, reset everything 
is to come over here and just kill your kernels, right? So let, let me show that. Um, I'm just gonna close this tab. So the tab is gone. I'm going to just reload the page. And I'm going to come over here and I'm going to shut down that kernel, right? And so everything is off now. And if I want to um, go back to that same notebook, I'll go back to it. It was untitled IPI and B. I'll double click it. I can open up Blackly again and then rerun. Rerun my cells as needed to get to, you know, where I need to be. So, you know, run, 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 run right uh, and that's it and that's it so these are the the basic steps for working with jupiter jupiter lab um, for working with our blockly extension there are many um, many things that i did not cover it's it's a professional grade <clears throat> development environment you can find a lot of documentation online when in doubt uh, as with any interface try to right click on things and see if there's a hidden menu um, you can do that in a lot of these tabs and get some interesting things like if i wanted to uh, duplicate an entire notebook or download it or any of these other things you know always always try right clicking um, also pretty much anything you can reach with right clicking exists in one of these menus so you can find things up there as well um, lots of different ways to change how it looks if, if that's something you you want to do um, there are lots and lots of, of options so but I, I think we've successfully covered the basics thank you